the day we're going to speak on, now last week you remember we spoke on the seven drops of blood for the forgiveness of sin. And this week we're going to speak on the seven transfers of the blood. Now the song told us about how the blood made us free from sin. And then the fourth verse told us how the blood made us the righteousness of God. And what we're going to talk about this morning is the seven transfers of the blood that develop you into the righteousness of God and into the maturity of the Christian life. So let's look at it. If you'll stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word, we're going to read from Colossians chapter 1, verses 10 through 14. And you're going to see something in this scripture whenever I show it to you that's going to utterly astound you. It should astound you. It will impress you. Let's read that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of, of the inheritance of the saints in light. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. In whom we have redemption through His blood even the forgiveness of sins. Now let's pray. Father, we thank you for the music this morning. What a wonderful job of glorifying the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords was provided for us today. The depth of our worship doesn't depend on anything more or less than us getting into the Spirit of praise as we hear the wonderful words about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, Father, as we break the bread of life today, I pray that you'll open our eyes that we can see and our ears that we can hear, our heart that we can understand what the Word of God is saying to us, and then that we can apply it to our lives because it's so critical that we don't just hear, but we apply, we act upon it. Now, Father, we thank you for these that have come to hear so we know that they are into your word. Now, Holy Spirit, we surrender to you and we surrender to your way today as you instruct us and lead us into the truth of God's word. Minister, I pray in the wonderful and mighty name of Jesus and we will give you praise and glory for every outcome. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And you may be seated. <laughs> Last week... <clears throat> We looked at the seven places from which Jesus bled for the forgiveness of sin and for man's purging and cleansing. This week we're going to look at those same seven places. Isn't it amazing that the same place He bled for your sin is the same place He bled for some transformation, for some change. Jesus fled the Garden of Gethsemane from his sweat for man's rebellion. To recap last week, he fled from his crown of his head for the soul of man and his sinful decisions. He fled from his back for the sins done against the body. He fled from, from his side for the sins done against the church. He fled from his hands for the sinful deeds that are done by our hands. And he fled from his feet for the sinful places that man go while rebelling and living in rebellion. So we see that man from... Now watch this now. Now watch what I'm about to say because this is a very big comment. We see that man from head to toe and from inside out was full of sin, depravity, and curse. Someone said to me, Pastor, we can see where he bled outwardly. How can you say from the inside out because that's where the sweat came from. Sweat did not come from his outer man, what you could see. His sweat came from his inner man, from his body. So he was a sinner from head to toe and from inside out. That's where every man minus Jesus Christ lives. He is a total depraved individual and locked under the curse of sin. Man, the God that you serve is a thinker. He didn't leave one piece of it undone. He didn't leave one piece of it out. 
He covered every avenue and every area for you so that you could come to know Jesus Christ. Now let's look at what God does for us once we are saved. Now I want you to bear in mind here. There is salvation in Jesus' name and there is the follower who lives in the maturity that the blood provides. The saved man will walk and try his best being saved to live for God, but will go through trials, troubles, and tribulations and adversity, will constantly and consistently fall under the weight of guilt and shame, find himself in a position where he is consistently seeking God for forgiveness of personal sin. That's what the saved man does. Because he knows that his sins were forgiven, and therefore when he sins through many of the various ways, through 17 works of the flesh, as Paul put it in Galatians 5, or through 23 works of the reprobate mind, which Paul determined in Romans chapter 1, He's constantly operating from a position of makeup because he got saved, but salvation and the life of salvation was the extent to which he understands the Christian life. But the blood of Christ that covers sin is much worth much more than just the covering of sin. To the believer. Now let's look at what that means. Colossians 1, 10 through 14. This is what it says. That you might walk worthy of the Lord. There you see Paul identify the places that the feet would go. And when the feet go under the salvation of the gospel of peace, then you walk worthy of the Lord. So right off the bat, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul is alluding to the blood of that Jesus shed from His feet. The deliverance from the power of sin, which is the first part of the working of the blood. And have translated us, or I went, I went too far, and uh, 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 that you might walk worthy of the Lord, and then unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. Well, there's His hands, the blood that He shed from His hands, and increasing in the knowledge of God, there's the blood that He shed from His head, Strengthened with all might, there's the blood that he shed for the church's power and authority, according to his glorious power, which are the words of his mouth, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, which is the development of his will, your will, after the will of God, giving thanks unto the Father, which is made of meat to be partakers of the inheritance. That is the bath for health and wealth. It is your inheritance for you to live in health and for you to live in the healing power of the blood of Christ. Now watch this. All the saints in light, peace that, the place that, uh, the place of the blood flows from that serves to enlighten the total man. Now we see that when Jesus bled from seven different places, for the transformation of man. He bled there once you got saved. So that you could come into the place. Of living under the illumination. Of Jesus Christ. The light. Look at what the word says. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us. What made you? The blood. Where did the blood come from? Well it came from his sweat. It came from his head. It came from his back. It came from his side. It came from his hands. It came from his feet. And it came from his beard. Seven different places that you were made. Made. Now when else did we see the word that something was made? Well we know it's in 2 Corinthians 5.21 where the Bible said he was made to be sin so that you might be made to be the righteousness of God. Now there is a difference between you being saved and you becoming the righteousness of God. The difference is the first work of grace made the unmerited favor available to you so that you could come to know 
Christ in the free pardon of your sin and, and create the, the reconstruction of your spirit man so that you can be in relationship with God. Then the second work of grace occurs and that second work of grace is the influence of God upon your person so that your person can grow and develop in these ways that you walk worthy of the Lord. That you be, proved, be pleasing and fruitful in every good work. That you increase in the knowledge of God. That you be strengthened with might. That you have His glorious power coming out of your mouth. And that patience and long suffering of your will. So that you can live a peaceful life. So that you can give thanks and walk in the total light of the gospel. What a blessed thing, huh? The total man. Now watch this now. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? Here we see. Now watch what I'm about to say. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 14, you see all of the works of the transformation of the cross. This astounded me whenever I saw it this week. I was beginning to put this message together and I thought, well, I know what I want to say. Now, and I know some places I want to preach it from, and the Holy Spirit takes me to 1 Corinthians and 1 to Colossians chapter 1. And the whole idea of the opening of the blood of Christ and the influence of God is in chapter 1, verses 10 through 14, as clear as I can say it, or as they would say, as clear as a bell. Look at these two processes here. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. Here we see the deliverance from the power of sin, which is the first part of the working of the blood. Now watch part two. And have translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. There is the second work of grace where God translates you and changes you and transforms you into the image of of His dear Son. Here we see the second work, which is the influence of God. This turning away from darkness is in fact a turning to the light. It gives us the perfect picture of David's description of the light as being a lamp unto our path to change him and a light to, uh, to his uh, a lamp unto his path and a light unto his feet so that he could be transformed by the places that he grows and become a mature follower of God in Christ. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what you're seeking when you come to the house of God? Aren't you looking for a way to be able to follow God without constantly having to live in the guilt of sin? Having to be repentant for things you say and things you do. Isn't that what we're looking for? Well, the Bible very clearly tells us that the seven places that Jesus Christ bled from were for your forgiveness of sins and for your personal development as a follower of Jesus Christ. And Paul taught it in Colossians chapter 1. Let me go back and read that one more time. That you might work walk worthy of Him, your feet will go to the right places. Unto all pleasing and fruitful in every good work, your hands will be anointed. And increasing in the knowledge of God, your head, your soul, your mind, will, and emotions will be focused and centered on Him. Strengthening you with all might. That came from the power that He gave the church when He said, All authority is given to me in heaven and in earth according to His glorious power which came from the words of His mouth. We saw that in Genesis chapter 1 and we know that He said to Isaiah, The words that come out of my mouth, they accomplish what I please them and do what I sent them to do. See, there is glorious power in the blood of Jesus Christ unto all patience and long suffering that your will might conform to the will of the Father. Those are seven transformational places that change the life of any man who finds them. They are seven transformations 
transformational places that change the life of any man who finds them. But we don't preach this today. I would venture to say you have never heard this before. I would venture to say that the story of the blood for salvation has been harped upon and preached upon to the point that when you sin, you wonder if this blood really works. Because it doesn't keep me from sinning. It doesn't keep me from having to repent. It doesn't keep me from bearing the guilt it doesn't keep me from hiding within me the sin that I commit. It doesn't keep me from not desiring to do the wrong thing. Because you never found the seven transformational parts of the blood. You only found the seven pieces of the blood for forgiveness. You never understood the seven transformational, life-changing, life-developing, life-translating, life-changing to the image of the Son of Jesus Christ because no one ever told you. No one ever said to you that you can come to the measure of the stature of Christ Jesus. No one ever told you that it was through the blood and only through the blood that you would get there. Oh, they told you you might get there through reading the Word. They said you could come to know Him through prayer. They said if you will come to church. They told you if you will give money. They told you if you will get involved. But church, I'm here to tell you today, until we understand the transformational deliverance of the blood of Jesus Christ that transforms you into a kingdom vessel, everything else will fall short. Someone said that means I'm not going to heaven. No, God, God is faithful to His Word. But your life should be a life of living that causes you to reign in this life. You will not reign if salvation, being saved rather, is the only piece of the gospel you have a hold on. You will be saved, but the gospel is deeper. And Jesus, through Paul, through the command of the Holy Spirit, told Paul the seven things that his blood would do for you if you would come into the dimension of the transformational blood of Jesus Christ that will bring you into the image of Christ Jesus. Now watch me now. Watch what I'm about to say. Listen carefully. Did Jesus Christ need to be saved? No. No. So when the transformation that we're talking about from the blood, it has nothing to do with your salvation. You've been saved or born again. It has to do with you developing the character and the life and coming into the image of righteousness of which Jesus Christ is the standard by which God measures righteousness. So it has nothing to do with you being saved. There is a dimension of the blood that we have never walked in. That we have never understood. That we have never identified. That we have never come to know. And therefore, we live in the dimension that I'm saved and on my way to heaven. And what that's done for the church is it's put us inside four walls and said, God bless us, keep us, and even so come Lord Jesus. While we go out the door and we struggle to live in a world full of sin, 
above the very thing that Jesus saved us from because we don't know how. You do. You do. How will you say, preacher? The blood of the influence of God is shed for you so that you can know how to be more than an overcomer. Now the saved person is an overcomer. Watch that. They're an overcomer. What well, they will come? They've been saved. When Jesus returns, if they're dead, they'll rise from the dead. If they're living, they'll go to meet him in the air. They are an overcomer. But what God intended for man was that you would be more than an overcomer. You would have control in this world because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Everywhere your foot touched would be blessed. Everything your hand touches would be blessed. Every thought you think would be blessed. Your will would be in tune with His will. Your word would be in tune with His word. And you would live to reign in this life. That's what this is about, church. Now let's just prove it. May I prove it to you? When God put Adam in the garden, what did Adam do? Was he an overcomer? Well, sure. But Adam was more than an overcomer in the garden. Because every animal that God created came before Adam. And Adam looked him in the eye and said, I'll call you. And God stood back to see what a man who stood in front of the lion would call that animal. God didn't call him. Adam called him. God didn't name him. Adam named him. And he stood in front of Adam and Adam looked up to God and said, well, we'll call him, Father. God said, yeah, Adam called him a lie. And Adam turned to him and said, you're a lie. Not because I said so, but because he said so. Then Adam would have been just an overcomer. But Adam looked in the face of the animal. God standing off to see what he would do. Took charge of that animal. And said, I will call you a lion. You will be a lamb. You will be a camel. You will be a dog, whatever the case may be. So Adam had what? Complete control. God gave Adam control over everything except two things. Actually, one thing. Because he told him he could eat all he wanted of the tree of life, but he couldn't touch he could eat all which, which tree was it that escaped him here? The tree of life, right? But he couldn't eat of the tree of knowledge. That's correct. And so Adam had complete control. He was in complete control. He was more than an overcomer. Don't you see that? God's plan for you is that you have complete control. Because he said, Paul said that you would reign in this life and be more than an overcomer. I told you this before. The boxer goes into the ring, you know, and he fights the fight. He gets bloodied and battered. In the tenth round, he knocks his opponent down. They count him out. He's bloody, bruised, and battered. In the locker room, they hand him a check. In walks his little petite wife who never threw up a, a, a blow. He turns to her and hands her the check. She's become more than an overcomer. She's in complete, what? Control. God's intention for you is that you live your life as a follower of Him and be transformed into the life where you reign. You will never reign when sin so desperately affects you that you wear it like an anchor around your neck. And it brings you disgrace and it brings you shame and it brings you hurt and you are constantly, constantly walking into the throne of God to repent 
Now, I'm not saying you're not going to ever have to do that. That's not what I'm saying. There are going to be times whenever you're going to make a mistake that's going to call for repentance. But the, the child of God who is transformed into the image of Christ Jesus is living in such a way that his words are not... Now, let's just look. Can you sin from your decisions? Absolutely. But under the transformation of blood of Christ, your decisions are measured against the image of Christ. Can you sin from your mouth? Absolutely. But the man who is transformed by the blood measures his words by the words of Jesus Christ. Can you sin from your hands? Absolutely. But the man who is transformed by the blood will consider what he's about to do before he does it with his hands. He will consider where he's about to go with his feet before he goes there with his feet because to the transformed man in the image of Christ, he is following after the command of the Holy Ghost who is leading you and guiding you into all truth. So the Spirit of God, because of the blood of God, is making a way for you to know where, when, and what so you can stay out of trouble. Now that's good news. That's good news. Because you're telling me, Pastor, that I have a choice in the spiritual world. That I have a choice about how I respond. Now watch this now. Because I'm going to teach you something you may never have heard. If you've heard it, then bless God. You know it, and I'm glad about it. There are two ways to handle everything that comes into your life. The first way is the way that leads to problems. You can react to anything that comes your way. You can react to it. Somebody says something you don't like, and your immediate reaction is, well, now, I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> Who do you think you're talking to? I got a guy that works with me does that all the time. <laughs> Who do you think you don't know? Who you are? What do you want? Does that all the time. No matter who says something to him, he, he immediately reacts. You can live life as a reactor. And if you do, you're going to stay in the realm of being saved and repent. Saved, but repent. I'm saved, but I'm repentant. Why? Because I was guilty because of my reaction. My reaction was an off-the-cuff statement or deed that I did that I now regret. There are two ways to live, you know. You can live as a reactor. But I choose to live as a responder. A responder. A responder does not come across with an immediate statement an immediate word or an immediate deed, the responder considers what has been said, gives it a few seconds before he makes a calculated response. There's a difference. People say to me, what's your reaction time? I say, I hope it ain't very quick. They say, why? If I learn to be a quick reactor, 99 times out of 100, my reactions are going to be inaccurate, incorrect, and often hurtful. But if I learn to be a responder, then I can take time to use the Holy Spirit that is in me to simply allow me to hear what the Spirit is saying, to know what the Word is saying, to think about how in the world should I respond to this situation? How many times a day do people come to me and say, Mike, I know you're in the ministry and I've got this going on. What would you suggest? Now I can say, well, uh, uh, if, if, if you don't like it 
And he does that again, punch him in the jaw. Have a good day. <laughs> but I can't say that. I have to give some calculated thought so that I can make a response that they can think through and hopefully then make a calculated response to their problem. Now I want you to think with me just a second. Don't, oh, don't raise your hand. Just think. How many times in your life have you reacted to a word, to a deed, to a person, and that reaction caused you to fall into anger, upset, or hurt somebody? Think about that. How many times has that happened to you? Well, it happens all the time, Pastor. You know that well. Then I'm here to tell you. What the blood of Jesus Christ that transforms you into a kingdom vessel does for you is that it gives you a different perspective to operate from. And that perspective is that you don't have to be a reactor anymore. You can be a responder and give a calculated answer to the world to the problem that faces you from the Word of God, the teaching of God, the Holy Spirit of God, because Christ in you, who is the hope of glory, is directing your words and your thoughts and your plans and your actions so that when you respond, you walk away full of the victory that comes from the Spirit of Almighty God. See? But we choose to react. We choose not to walk in the light of the Word. Who hath delivered us, now I want you to get this part right here, hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. The man that is translated into the kingdom of His dear Son has been changed by the second work of grace, which is the influence of God to change you. I have a friend who every time he gets mad will stand up and tell you, that's just the way I am. Glory to God, then what has salvation, what has being saved, what has the blood done for you? Because it has not changed you. It has saved you but you're still having to repent for reactions that are contrary to the Word of God. I want you to be changed. Now watch this line right here. The influence of God to change us and translate us into a kingdom vessel. If you're not trying to be a kingdom vessel, then what you're trying to do is live in trouble, anguish, hurt, anxiety. If you're not trying to live is and become a translated kingdom vessel. This is what has been promised to you. He said you would be delivered out of the power of darkness. Now what that means is out of the control of darkness and translated into the kingdom under the image of His dear Son. Now that says volumes, doesn't it? Sure it does. In whom... Now look at this now. In whom we have redemption. We are ransomed in full. This word means the full plan of salvation. Everything that's included in it. Preservation, safety, soundness, healing and security. All given to you because you have been redeemed. Through, now how did you get there? Through His blood. It's the only way to get there. Here, His blood is identified as the agent that allows grace and forgiveness and cleansing and grace and development for purity. Even the forgiveness of sins, the beginning of grace in the favor of God is that man is forgiven of sin. The influence of God will not exist for mature living unless this fact is in place. That means that everything that I read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 through 13 will not exist until you come under the blood for salvation. When this is in place, the individual can begin to express the fruit of the Spirit 
That is the outward effects of the influence of God. This is what the blood does. But we have lived in it and we have attempted to serve God only in the cleansing of the forgiveness of sin. And that is, that, that is a good place to start. But the Bible declares that if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. So sin is going to be a future problem. Until you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 through 13. Because there you found that you could be translated into a different vessel through the same blood that saved you. Even the forgiveness of sin. You can be forgiven of your sin. And you can be translated into a kingdom vessel. That, friends, is what the blood does. Bow your heads and close your eyes with me. There's so much more on this. But I want to tell you today. He has sweat for the breaking of your rebellion so that you can be changed and translated to know the will of God. That's why He sweat for blood for you. So that you could know the will of God. Wouldn't you like to know the will of God for your life? His head was bleeding for the sins of your mind and your emotions so that you could be changed and translated to live in the mind of Christ. I want you to think about that while you've got your head back. Your mind in the spirit world can operate in the mind of Christ. His beard bled for the sins of your mouth that led to death so that you could be changed and translated to speak the words of life. Think about that. The power of the tongue is death and life. His back for the sins against your body so that you can be changed and translated into a life of health and healing. Think about that. His side for the sins you committed against the head of the church. Your sin is sin against Christ so that you can be translated and changed into the measure of the stature of Christ. Don't you want that? His hands for the sins you committed through work and play that were against the teachings of Christ so that you could be changed and translated into the operation of the anointing. And the feet for the sins that covered the places you went that were unholy and out of the path of blessing towards evil. So that you can be changed and translated into feet that were walking after the path of peace and the path of light. Those are the seven transformations of the blood that belong to you. But you didn't know it. So you couldn't live in it. You didn't know it. So you couldn't pursue it. But now you do. Now right where you stand, where you sit, I want you to pray this prayer. Father, forgive me for having my own will. Father, forgive me for using my mind and emotions in ways that are against you. Father, forgive me for the words that I said that were against you, full of death. Father, forgive me of the sins I've done against my body. Father, forgive me for the sins that I have done against the head of the church, Jesus Christ. Father, forgive me of the things my hands have done that have been unholy. Father, forgive me of the places my feet have gone that have run to evil. 
Now, Father, having repented of those today, I ask you to transform me. Transform me into the image of Christ. Through the blood, I receive the will of God as the director of who I am. Today, through the blood, I receive my mind and my emotions to make choices to follow the Spirit of God. Today, I receive words that are life into my life. Today, I receive healing in my body from the blood you shed from your back. Today, I receive the glory of Christ, who is the head of the church, of which I include. Today, I receive a new anointing with my hands so that when I put them to work they bless you and in turn they bless me and I put my feet on a path of peace to walk into the light so that I may know you in the resurrection so that I may know the power of the resurrected Christ in my heart. In Jesus' name, now stand and give Him praise. Father, we praise You today. We worship You today and we honor You. As we prayed this prayer, we simply receive what we've asked. Because You said that if we would ask, we would receive. If we would seek, we would find. And if we would knock, You would open it unto us. So the translation of the blood has been brought to us so that we can become responders through the name of Jesus Christ into our world and live the life of being more than an overcomer and so that I can reign in this life in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. feel that in my soul. I'm going to tell you that right now. My spirit man is leaping on the inside of me. I am a king. I am a priest. I am a child of the living God. And I am more than an overcomer in this life. And I reign by Christ Jesus. I reign over circumstances and situations. Because the blood has made it so. Amen. Give the Lord a big hand clap of praise. Yeah,